And let's go through this camera package. A tripod, which I really like. I have one myself. Um, I personally like operating it this way because these are called two-stage tripods. I'm gonna I'm gonna get some height on it by loosening the bottom knuckles first. Do you guys see what I'm doing? And this top one's locked. I haven't I haven't uh, extended this. I extend the bottom ones first. Leave the top ones locked, and then if I'm on a set, I need to do a quick adjustment. I can do it really, I can do it right here quickly. Does it still have some height here? As opposed to having to bend over in the middle of a set, loosening these things. So it's just a style I use. Everybody good there? Good tripods? A nice smooth tripod tilt. After I loosen the lock, the lock is here on the side. So just make sure it's smooth and continuous with no bumps along the way because that will show up in your movie. Um, the panning drag is changed with this twisting handle here. Um, that is a feature of this tripod I, I should have mentioned. Good, good question. If I want lots of resistance on this um, tripod when I pan, I can turn this thing counterclockwise and you'll see it gets very tough to pan it. So maybe I'm doing a really slow, elegant, Pan shot. Oh, yeah. Well, you want some resistance to make to push against you, so you can do it without a lot of starts and stops. But if I have to move quickly, I might go the other extreme and make it loose, or because um, it's hard to pan quickly without all that resistance. So it's called drag. It's one reason this tripod costs eight hundred dollars instead of two hundred dollars. Um, the panning mechanism for this tripod, the lock is on the front. And I would do a 360 and just make sure that I I'm not, don't have a damaged piece. Um, and the same is true for tilting. There's a, dr a drag um, <laughs> functional. You can change it here on the side with more or less tension, depending on how you twist it. So that, that's a great feature of this tripod. OK? Um, it also has a level for leveling, which often when we move, move camera positions, the floor is not level, uh, or it's supposed to be level, but it's an old building. Well, very quickly underneath, we loosen the handle. And if you guys have done any carpentry work with levels, it's the same principle. We put the, the bubble in the center of the circle with one hand, and we tighten with the other. And then very quickly, we have level, which will make a difference to an audience. Uh, before we put the camera on, hold on a second. We'll do it together. Um, these cameras are about $6,200 um, with the uh, chips, cards in here, the SYS cards. I don't know, somewhere in the range of 7,000 and up. Um, so it's a, it's a hefty piece of equipment. It's a, it's a wonderful piece of equipment, I think. But keep track of your camera, take care of it. Um, do t use the final screw on the base plate, um, the final tightening with a coin, because you really want that tight. Or all, all your pans and tilts are going to be wobbly. You can't really tighten it by finger. And everybody's seduced by the camera, even looky loose or. or so you're going to get pushed away from equipment and camera department pretty quick um, because we only have one and it's expensive. I also think it's the case that, that many times the camera department is more tight about it's because I think in many ways the lighting and the grip crews, when they do their work, their work is sort of seen as, and it's complete as we sh before we shoot. And much of the camera work, like pulling focus, camera operator, is done as we shoot. So I think the camera department feels a little more vulnerable to results in the moment of production as opposed to most of the crew that has done their work when we shoot. So there's a different level of intensity, I think, sometimes. And so little things might, might set them off. And one of them is putting a battery into a camera that's already turned on. So, so the center position is off on camera. The battery goes into the chamber in the back on the right-hand side of the chamber and slides to the back and clicks in. Sl slides to the left, excuse me, and should click in. And as we go, I'm going to have you put this into what we consider to be the manual mode of this camera's controls. But with crew especially, um, I w we want you guys to control almost I mean, as many elements as you can. So we're not, we do not gravitate towards the auto modes that, that make decisions for us. We gravitate towards the manual modes where you're making decisions for specific reasons, hopefully based on the logic, thematic, and emotional tone, and 
like that. So from the front of the lens back, um, let's start. So we're looking at the, at the LCD side of the camera, you guys. LCD is the little flip-out door. The other one's called a viewfinder in the language of this camera and, and most cameras. Um, one thing you'll notice right away, if you, if you look at the, the focus uh, ring on the front of the lens, is that you can actually see numbers that spin as you spin the lens. It's telling you basically at what distance you'll have critical focus, the six feet, three feet. In a lot of the prosumer cameras, the VX1 and even some of the other HD cameras, this, this wheel will alter focus, but it doesn't have a start and stop point with known um, markings that you can rehearse and then re replicate during a shot. You just, you just have to find it on the fly. The foot markers and the meter markers are consistent and memorable and can be rehearsed and then practiced during a shot to change focus. Underneath is a button that's going to let you maintain um, manual control on the zoom or put it in servo mode and now the, the uh, side handle will let you zoom and pan, uh, zoom out and zoom in on your zoom lens. See how it works. What does the iris refer to? What, what, what does that altering within the visual image? Your aperture. Okay, what does that mean? Light uh, how light much light it's letting in. Okay, very good. So we're gonna put it to manual mode on the iris. <laughs> uh, macro on this lens, you guys know what that means, refers to? Your ability to focus very closely to objects, um, closer than the, the normal lens will let you focus. So if you want to use macro, you, you turn it on and you can, you'll see the focus ring will let you focus very, very close within a few inches of the lens. Bottom of the camera, uh, gain, are you guys familiar with gain? Our, our ability to artificially officially boost the brightness of the image. Um, and that's within the menu, you can set up different levels there. It's just kind of awkward to hold it, so they give you the ability to rotate it. And that's pretty much it. Underneath, again, I said the servo versus the manual button for zoom. My theory is that when you're born, you start learning how not to hear. Because if you didn't, you'd go crazy. Your brain becomes this incredible filter that just overrides all the nonsense noise, or what would be nonsense noise. You hear, your ears hear everything all the time. Your brain decides what to focus on. So we're gonna try by the end of this process to give you a little bit more focus with your hearing. That's the objective. But uh, we're gonna focus mostly today on uh, just recording sound. So this guy's a boom person and you see where he's pointing the mic right now. He's, he's trying to record my voice, and you generally want to get some chest. If you put your hand on your chest and just speak, you'll notice that your chest vibrates. The vibration is what sound is. So that's a, it's like a speaker cabinet your body is. Then likewise, your mouth, you're projecting sound out of. And if you start thinking of sound as being colors, it helps because it's made up of many frequencies. And the low frequencies are very large sound waves. The high frequencies are very small. So if you imagine what that means as far as words coming out of your mouth, the higher frequencies are far more directional. The lower frequencies go like this. The higher ones like this. So if he's off mic, that brightness that the, the higher frequencies bring is going to be missing. If, he's, if I'm on mic, that's going to be there. And that's what you have to start listening for when you're recording sound. Now, the microphone he's using is designed specifically to focus on the spoken word, focus on someone speaking. It's very directional in comparison to uh, an Omni mic. This is a hypercardioid, I believe. Is that right? So that's what you'll be using as well. And one of the things I want you to do today after we just go through the basic setups is start experimenting with on mic, off mic, finding that sweet spot. 
and that's that's really the best way to think of it. Uh, there's another technique that sometimes is used having a flashlight instead of a microphone so you can see where it's pointed. But I, I think it's really more beneficial to start just using your ear as soon as possible. Um, I'm fond of saying there's only one rule in sound and that's if it sounds good, it is good. And uh, it simplifies things and it, it kind of cuts to the chase. In other words, whenever you record something, what do you believe the most important thing in the process is? Listening critically. A lot of people tell you to record sound at a like minus 20 on a meter. Record as hot a signal as possible without distorting. The reason being that every system has a noise built into it. And the closer your recording that you want is to that what's called noise floor, the less you can do with it. Because when you turn it up, that noise floor comes up faster than what you're turning up. So it's far better to turn something down than to turn it up. That's a real fundamental concept to uh, embrace. It's really important to listen while you're recording and right after you've recorded. Okay, so let's take a look at the, the basic kits. Fish pole, boom, just like he has here. Um, the important thing with equipment, it, something I learned in film school early on, is just it's the tools of the trade. The more you respect them, the better job they'll do. If, if you know any mechanics or carpenters, a good carpenter, a good mechanic, if you look at their tools, they're always nice. A carpenter that's not very good, a mechanic that's not very good, they're tossed around. It's uh, very indicative. So the important thing with these boom poles is you've got to loosen these to extend them, right? And then tighten through this and you connect to the camera so that you can monitor. We're going to be recording into the camera, which uh, generally speaking, you don't want to do. If you, if you look, he's not recording into a camera, right? He's got a little kit right down here on the floor, a recorder and a mixer, and he's recording into that. The camera's independent. That's the ideal situation. You have more control. And your case is going to be kind of a down and dirty approach. We're going to record straight into the camera, and the boom person is not going to be able to monitor meters. You're going to have to rely on their ears, which are your ultimate meter. We'll go over that some more tomorrow as well, and I've got a, a CD with some handouts and guides on it for you that I'll give you today. This has a little belt clip. You clip it on, and you can have a feed from the camera. Connects here. There's a little groove in there to insert the cable, so you can form a loop. And again, if you look at this setup here, you'll see how the cables are handled and then wrapped around the fish pole so that you control the cable because this will be recorded. So just ask yourself, what's more important when you have a camera, the camera body or the lens? The lens. The lens. And it's the same way with recording sound. The recorder itself, especially in these days, is not nearly as important as the microphone. <coughs> Nowadays, digital sound, you're just recording a series of zeros and ones. It's, it's pretty close high-end recorders to low-end recorders, actually, as far as the recording technology. It's the microphone that really sets things apart. Uh, you talked about your camera with the automatic settings and whatnot, and that's what you're going to find with consumer-oriented cameras. The sound is made to keep you from hurting yourself. 
the sound portion. In other words, they're going to have an automatic gain, which is the, think of a onboard computer that's kind of listening ahead and hears something that's too loud, so it turns the record level down, and then it turns it back up, and then it turns it down, and it turns it back up. So that's not a great idea to do professionally because what happens is the background, all the other sounds, start doing this and you start hearing it. Yeah. So you want to try and override that as much as possible. Okay, so everybody gather around the camera here. I know you've been introduced to this already, right? Yeah. Yesterday. Mm -hmm. So who knows where the record level controls are? Okay, right here. So that's one of the three, right? Yeah. Where's the monitor level? I'm not sure. Anybody? The monitor level for the audio? Yeah. Is on the bottom right corner? You mean that? This is right up here. That's two. Where's the meter? Bottom of the screen, generally. Right here, right? Yeah. And it, just make a note of uh, all the information in this viewfinder. Most of it is static. Doesn't have anything to do with anything once you make settings. But that meter is dynamic, right? It's always reading when you're recording. And look how small it is. And that's kind of indicative of sound. And what you're going to have to do is set levels that uh, are based on some sort of idea of rehearsal. First thing you, you learn when you're doing sound is that during rehearsal, actors perform at this level. But as soon as they hear action, they perform at this level. So you have to kind of build that in. The other thing is you have two tracks here to record on. You want to record as hot a signal as possible without distorting. So what's a good way to get around that? Half one up higher and one a little lower. Oh, yeah. Yes, you use one track as a safety of the other. So you want to set the level on channel two lower than channel one. Mm -hmm. And then that'll be your safety. Uh, the camera person needs to let the sound person know where the frame line is and the sound person needs to start tuning in to where the frame line is. By the end of a shoot, generally speaking, a sound recorder will start to understand how the cinematographer is working and kind of have a feel for what's going on. It's you, Generally, the rule of thumb is never adjust the record level once you start recording for various reasons we'll go in later. Move that mic, so come on in. When he does that, I get louder. And then as he moves away, I get quieter. But the recording level doesn't change. And that's, that's a really important thing. <coughs> so if, if it's a sound recorder, so you know <coughs> that an actor's about ready to explode, You've got to anticipate and move away. But then, whenever you do that, you've got to then think about adjusting this, right? And sometimes it makes more sense to be like this. So don't set this and then just leave it. 